and officially welcome you to this UNT Retiree Association event. I know that in addition to uh, obviously retirees, we have some OLLI members joining us today as well. So I wanna welcome those of you who are with us and anybody who's watching the recording. Um, we're gonna have an update on the College of Visual Arts and Design as well as a presentation on art forgery uh, from Dr. Evans. And she's going to give a, a full introduction uh, of herself, but I'll just, kind of welcome her by giving a quick rundown of some of her credentials. She is an associate professor of art education in the College of Visual Arts and Design, uh, where she's also coordinator of the Art Museum Education Certificate. She's worked or interned at museums, galleries, and art institutes in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the United States. She studied art crime at the Association of Research into Crimes Against Art in Italy and has a postgraduate degree in antiquities, trafficking, and art crime from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And during the summers, she lectures about art crime on cruise ships that sail the high seas. So here to tell us about all the things she does is Dr. Laura Evans. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with you all today, um, beaming into your homes virtually. Uh, I guess this is one of the benefits of the pandemic, right, is that we can do things like this. Um, and I'm also delighted to be here because um, my dad just recently retired. Um, he lives in Chicago, and I uh, don't think this is how he planned to spend his first year of retirement, as I'm sure you guys are all feeling about retirement as well. But um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with just saying to Jordan before you all joined, like, I wonder if my dad has any idea that these sorts of things exist. Um, I'm going to push him to look into his undergraduate school and see if any of these great opportunities are there. Um, I am an educator, so I'd really what I'd really love to do is just like sit here and talk to you all about what you studied at UNT and to hear how your pandemic has been. Um, but I was I was brought on to give you a little update about CVAD and um, to give you a lecture about art crime, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. So um, I, I will I will get to that. So. First, I'm going to give you a CVAD update, the College of Visual Arts and Design, and then I'm going to give you a little introduction to me and my work, and then we'll get into the fun stuff, which is um, the lecture. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that now? Super, okay. All right. Okay, so Jordan very nicely introduced me, um, Laura Evans. I teach in the Department of Art Ed, I'm in charge of the Art Museum Education Certificate at RUNT. And I will get into a lot more of this later. But first I want to um, start with giving you a little update. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Jordan, can you see this one now, the video? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll have this going in the background. I guess the big update from around CVAD is that um, we have a brand new building. Um, it was built in the fall, it was finished in the fall of 2019 and was designed by the Dallas firm Corgan along with a Boston based firm, uh, Mikado Silvetti. And the old CVAD building was renovated, a new building was built and joined together as you can see there in the middle, there's kind of like a middle building that's gonna join those two together. And um, so the new building is a four story building uh, for a total of 238,000 uh, square feet of space. So it's pretty incredible. Get back to my slide here so I can show you some pictures of our beautiful new building. So this is what the new building looks like on that right hand side of your screen. You can see kind of like the transition new, um, new part of the new building as well. And then in the far back of your left screen is the old building. And um, if this building was designed for maximum collaboration and creativity, and as you can see, there are just these beautiful floor to ceiling windows that 
let in a ton of natural light, which is great for making art. And it also gives the building this very porous feeling between the campus and the, and the college and Denton. Um, one of my favorite rooms is on the very top of the fourth floor. It's a conference room and we have all our department meetings there. And you have this great view out to the, the courthouse in downtown um, Denton and the square from that room. And so I like to just um, you know, when things get a little tough in those department meetings, I just like to gaze out those windows. You can see like um, birds flying around in the sky and uh, that's that's like my escape room. So uh, one of the things that I love the most about working at CVAD is walking through the building and just seeing art hanging everywhere. And there were three gallery spaces in the old building. There's this new one that you can see here and um, that was that's in the new building and pr pretty much every space in the new building is designed to be an exhibition space. So um, you'll like the hallways are just covered in work. Um, my husband and I are very, very modest art collectors. Um, and Jordan, I just got a note that said my internet connection is unstable. Are you guys having any trouble hearing me? It's been okay so far. Okay. We, yeah, I think okay. I'll let you know if it cuts out or anything. Thank you. This, like, I feel such personal responsibility over my internet. I don't know if you guys feel this way when you're on these Zooms and something happens. It's like, I don't know, it's like my internet is out to get me or something. But um, so art is everywhere in the new building. And my husband and I are very modest art collectors. And um, the, most of the work that we have in our home is actually just from wandering the halls at CVAD and finding a student's work that we love and then, you know, like emailing them and saying, hey, I really loved that piece. Like, have you ever considered selling it? Um, so we have an awesome collection of student work in our house. And um, it's often these students first experience with selling their work. Uh, I'm thinking of one time I, I saw this, it was at an opening and I saw a student's painting that I really loved and she was standing there right beside the painting with her mother. And, and I said, oh, I really love this painting. Like, um, I'd love to buy it from you. Have you thought about selling it? And she just burst into tears because um, she'd never had anybody, you know, want to buy her work before. So she was, she was thrilled, we were thrilled. Um, and you know they're starving students and artists, so they don't mind. Uh, they don't mind selling for sure. So this is one of the new gallery spaces at CVAD. Um, it's sadly been languishing since COVID, as the whole new building has. It was opened in the fall of 2019, and now is just kind of empty, um, which is really, really sad. Um, and what breaks my heart is that all these graduating students, um, especially MFA students, were, are expected to have an exhibition of their work as part of their graduation. It's a great moment for them. They get to celebrate these years that they've put into making work. And all of those weren't able to happen this, you know, in this last year and a half. So um, they had to show their work online and you know, art is hard to, is different to look at online. It's just not quite the same. So. That was, that was really sad, but we did bring in a brand new gallery director to CVAD last year. Um, she's coming to us from the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, which is just uh, an amazing, amazing museum in uh, Kansas City. If you've never been, I would highly recommend it. Um, so we've been told that we are going back to in-person classes in the fall. Our provost said that we should treat it like fall of 2019. Um, so there won't be necessarily social distancing. It's too soon to tell if they'll be requiring masks, uh, but hopefully this means we'll get those, get the art back up on the walls and people getting through that building. Another amazing part of the new building is we have all this space for this collection that we have at UNT, which is a is the best kept secret in my opinion at UNT is called the Texas Fashion Collection. And it is one of the largest fashion collections in the United States. And uh, it's a gem. There are pieces in that collection that would make your head spin. It's run by Annette Becker, who is just a whip smart breath of fresh air. And I think she is poised to really take this collection to the next level. And my 
greatest hope and dream for CVAB is that a museum gets built for this fashion collection. Uh, we have this new space in the new building where there's like a study space and there's a little exhibition space for the fashion collection, but I'd like to see it be like a whole entire building. Um, but if you ever need another speaker for UNTRA events, I would highly recommend Annette. She will wrap you around her little finger. She's so engaging. And even if you don't care about fashion, I promise you will after you speak to her. And another really exciting new piece of news from CVAD is that we have a new dean. So uh, Dr. Karen Hutzel will be joining us in the, the summer, really starting in the fall. And uh, she is um, coming to us from the Ohio State University. And she is the where she was the chair of arts administration, education and policy. And I got to sit on the search committee for the new dean and we had really amazing candidates, but Dr. Hutzel rose to the top for her collaborative, caring, very inclusive approach. And as an art educator, I am absolutely thrilled that an art educator is going to be at the helm of my college. It's like mind boggling to me. So I, I am delighted and can't wait for her to start. Uh, we're also in the midst of hiring for a new chair in studio art, a chair of art education, and a chair of art history. So it's going to be a really exciting time at CVAD in the fall when all of these new people start. It's like pretty much a whole new leadership team. So um, lots of opportunity there. Okay, so that's the news from CVAD. Um, we're all really looking forward to being back together in the fall. It's been hard to be, to, to, to not connect, to get to connect with your colleagues in that way. So I, for one, am, am really excited to go back to teaching in person. Um, so with that context in place about the new building, I'm gonna try to move into introducing to myself to you guys. And I'm gonna try to move through this pretty quickly. Uh, to break up the talking. So this is a little map of where I've been and I'll try to get into each of these places in a very short period of time. So I was born outside of Chicago and grew up going to the Art Institute, which is on your left there. I um, didn't uh, grow up in an art going family or, or museum growing family actually. Um, my first museum memory is going to the Art Institute for a class field trip in the first grade. And apparently I felt so comfortable and inspired that I just like peeled off from the field trip group. They were all going to lunch um, at the restaurant and I just like snuck away and gave myself my own tour and police had to be called and, you know, museum security and they found me in front of the Marc Chagall stained glass windows there. Um, so my mom likes to tell that story to say like, you know, from a very young age, you've always loved museums, but I, I, I guess I kind of forgot about them for a long period of time. And I went to a small liberal arts school named Denison University in Ohio to be a poet. Um, that was my goal was to be a, a poetess. And I, I went on like a poetry fellowship and um, I took an art history class. I'd never even heard of art history. I took my first art history class in my first semester of freshman year. And I just fell head over heels in love with it. And I think what I loved about it so much was that it was like learning a new language, learning how to look at a work of art and decode it and what these signs and symbols meant was not something that I'd ever experienced before. And it was thrilling to me. And as someone who loves stories. I loved that there were these stories in works of art and I kind of started to see museums as like these giant storybooks where you could walk from page to page and learn learn a new story about the history of mankind. So um, so I yeah fell head over heels in love with art and switched my major and I think my parents are probably the only parents in the world to get a call from their daughter who says, mom and dad, I'm gonna become an art history major and for them to feel relieved because they thought their daughter was gonna be a poet. And to go from a poet to an art historian is like maybe slightly more financially stable. Um, so they were like very relieved to hear that news. 
so my first museum internship was at the Museum of Contemporary Art, which is on your right side at, in Chicago. And that just sealed the deal for me. I was like, yes, I absolutely want to do this. I studied abroad in New Zealand for a year. And I worked at uh, an art gallery while I was down under um, studying South Pacific art history. And when I came home, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. I loved studying uh, South Pacific art, but I, so I was accepted with like a full ride to the University of Hawaii to do my PhD in South Pacific art history. And you're probably wondering, why didn't you go to Hawaii for, for your career? And it's because I thought that someday I might get tired of studying that, but I didn't think I would ever get tired of studying art museums. I was just, I could spend days in one art museum and just be content. And so I made, I think this was one of my first like big girl decisions where I was like, okay, I'm gonna go study this thing that I think I would be happier studying instead of this go live on a, living on a beach in Hawaii. So I went to the University of Toronto, which is on your, the, the city of Toronto on your left. And in your upper right is um, the University of Toronto campus. And um, I studied museums there. I did a master's in museum studies and uh, interned at the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida, which is in your bottom right corner while I was doing my master's. And um, again, just this all cemented my great love for art museums. And it was finally the moment where I realized I wanna be a museum educator. So my internship at the Ringling Museum was in education and um, I just, I found my people. I was like, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. So I, uh, after graduate school, was um, awarded this fellowship at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., where I worked in the education department um, for, for a year. And that was just an incredible experience. I am so grateful for that opportunity um, and made lifelong friends, um, not just with colleagues, but with works of art there. Like every morning I would stop in and see this Vermeer, the girl with the red hat. And I feel like those works of art, works of art became friends too. Uh, after um, the National Gallery, I went to Columbus, Ohio to do my PhD at the Ohio State University. Um, while I was there, I worked at the Columbus Museum of Art at the Wexner Center for the Arts. And um, this was when I was finishing my doctorate and was given the job at UNT. So that's when I came down here and um, have been here for 10 years with one brief year of, uh, of leave. We, my husband and I transferred to Perth in Western Australia for a, a year. And um, it was for my husband's job, but I was able to find work at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Arts, which is on your top left and I was the education curator there. Um, and as you can see from the bottom left, it is a stunningly beautiful place to live. I've heard it described as like California in the 1950s. It's very laid back and like family oriented and beautiful and wild. And um, so that's my husband and I in front of our like local lighthouse. You could just walk to down the street from where we lived. I have always been obsessed with art crime. And I don't know what it is exactly. I don't love, I don't like other crime, like where people are hurt or murdered or um, that just curdles my stomach. And I think I, one of the reasons why I love art crime so much is because nobody gets hurt really. <laughs> There's like very few cases of people getting hurt. Um, and I really love art crime that is about like idealistic reasons. And um, we'll, we'll see a character today that, that had some idealistic reasons for doing what he did. But um, so just on my own time, I've, I've made, made space in my life to study art crime. Um, I don't really get to teach about it very much, though I am teaching my first honors art appreciation or art crime class next spring at UNT. Uh, the most that I get to talk about it is with um, the Ollie folks, which is a, such a delight for me. And uh, 
Uh, so I spent a summer studying art crime at this um, this essentially like art crime think tank in Amalia, Italy, which is in Umbria. It's um, about an hour north of Rome. And I lived in, I could point it out to you, um, lived in this tiny little house right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, but got to spend the summer there just studying art crime and wandering through Italy. Um, didn't, doesn't get much better than that for me. Um, but I enjoyed it so much that I ended up getting a postgraduate degree in antiquities trafficking and art crime from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, all of this kind of combined. And when there aren't COVID, when there isn't COVID, I usually spend summers or spring breaks lecturing about art crime on um, luxury cruise ships that, that sail around the world. So that's a real gas for me. Uh, as you probably can tell based on the photos and what I've shared so far, I love to travel. So it's um, a great way to get to see the world. Um, I think I'm going to blow through these next few slides because I've already taken up more time than I thought I would with this, this introduction. So I guess I'll just give you a quick rundown of what my semester has been like um, this last semester. So I teach about art museums and art museum education at UNT. And this semester, I've been teaching a course on how to teach with objects, like giving the tools to my students to be able to go into the museum and facilitate a really robust and rich discussion with other people. Um, I think the purpose of art museum education is to connect people to objects. So teaching them how you do that, how you, how you make those connections and how you get a dialogue going with people and with, with um, works of art. And you know the pandemic has made this challenging in a number of ways. Like I mentioned earlier, looking at art online is just a very different experience than seeing it in person. You know, to see it in on your screen versus in three dimensions, it's there's nothing comparable to seeing it in person. But we've we've really tried to make do. And one of the great things about teaching online has been that I got to zoom in people from all over the world to my classes. So we had all of these people as guests, um, people who have written, you know, seminal texts in the field, um, amazing scholars, directors of education at museums in like the Clark Art Institute, um, the Dallas Contemporary, uh, this guy in your lower right corner is the world's first full-time art therapist at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, this woman in the middle is from Amsterdam. Uh, this guy right here is one of my favorite people in the entire world. I'll talk about him in a minute. His name is Terry Barrett. And so that's been a real silver lining of, of teaching during the pandemic for me is to get my students access to these awesome people that you probably wouldn't have gotten to have class with before because of time and money and um, you know the, the vagaries of the space time continuum, I guess. I'm gonna skip this for time. But that's just something I've been working on. Um, the other, I'll, I'll give you one little slice into what my research is uh, as an art museum educator outside of telling you about art crime. Uh, so this is a project that I've been working on. This is our tentative title for our book. And it's, um, it's something I've been working on with one of my mentors. Uh, he is, um, he used to be a professor at UNT. He's since retired. He was also my advisor at the Ohio State University. So I kind of followed him down to UNT. And um, his wonderful wife and him and I have been thinking about um, this. It's been an interest of our, all of ours mutually for a very long time. And so essentially I'm writing a book with two of my very best friends. And it's about how looking at and talking about art and specifically contemporary art can help us learn more about ourselves and other people. And we believe that you know when you're looking at and talking about 
um, are looking and listening to other people doing the same, we can broaden and deepen our understandings and appreciation of art, self, others, and, and the world. So at its core, this book is about listening to other people and building empathy through the lens of art. And we write about classes we've taught, discussions at museums we've led or been a part of, workshops we've guided, informal chats we've had about, about art. And we use these experiences along with discussion and writing prompts to build these rich narratives of these experiences. So um, this, you know, I, one of my favorite quotes is that the, the shortest path between two people is a story. So we like to use all of these stories to make our point here that you can learn a lot about other people when you talk about art together. Um, so hopefully this book will, this will be a book at a museum bookstore near you someday. We're probably about halfway through writing it. And it has been such a joy to work on this with two people that I looked up, look up to so very much and to be mentored in this experience in, of, of writing a book together. So, um, so that's the big thing that I've been working on lately and um, for my research. So I think I'll pause here to ask if you have any questions about the new building or CVAD or um, art museum education, anything at all before I launch into our lecture. Feel free to use the chat feature or if you prefer to unmute yourself, uh, you can do that as well. So we got a couple of comments from Mr. Davis who said he went to the Balenciaga show at the Kimball and was surprised how many items were there from the uh, fashion collection from UNT. Yes. And yeah, looks like he also has an interest in the Duchess of Devonshire, which um, mm -hmm. you talked about earlier this semester. Oh, I, I want to hear more about that. So is it, um, it, it looks like you took another class at a different school of, that was also art crime related. Is that how I'm understanding that? And if you wanted to unmute yourself, uh, Mr. Davis, you could go ahead. Yes. Ooh, well, I'd love to talk to you sometime about what you learned there. Maybe we, maybe you can email me and we can get a conversation going. I'm jealous that you got to go to a, an art crime class. I want to, I want to go. <laughs> uh, Le Lenora is wondering if you saw the fashion collection. Yeah, they um, and some people on this call might have been there, but I think right before the pandemic, we we got to sneak in right when the new building was done, and uh, Annette um, Becker showed us uh, oh. the fashion collection. So she has done that for Antra, and of course, she's taught um, several classes for Ollie. Oh, good. But yeah, a few of our members were lucky enough to see it. She's great. She was one of my former students, and I'm really proud of of her. She's done an amazing job. Okay, well, you can hold on to your questions till the end too, if you wanna ask about anything. Um, we can make a mishmash of a Q&A at the end there. So, um, you know, I heard this interesting um, podcast or like radio show the other day that mentioned that one of the casualties of the pandemic has been just casual gossip that we, you know, like everyone's lives are kind of very much the same from day to day right we don't we don't get to gossip a lot with other people and when we do talk about like what's been going on in our day you know it's um like i said pretty uh it's like groundhog day right we're doing the same thing every single day so i thought i would give you some good gossip today i'm gonna live enliven your day with some real gossip albeit it's like 60 years old gossip but I think it's still some good gossip about um, one of the fixtures of the Dallas art world, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, but let's not that let that spoil our gossip session here today. So you know, museums are considered to be these like temples of discernment and good taste, and when you walk into a museum you expect the works of art on display to be authentic and chosen for their beauty. And, and more than that, maybe sometimes their singularity, right? That they're the one true piece of, uh, 
that the, the only piece of its kind, right? Um, what I think most of us don't expect is that they could be they could be fakes. <laughs> and the story I'm going to tell you um, may make you rethink all of this when you go into the museum. And this shocking statistic uh, is also just mind blowing. And this is this quote is from uh, one of the former directors of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And when he was director from 1967 to 1977, he said that 10 to 40% of the art that he looked at to acquire for the Met's collection were fakes or forgeries, um, which is a staggering amount, right? Just unbelievable to think about. So the tale I'm going to tell you today involves some characters who have really done their fair share of contaminating the art market with forgeries. And in particular, um, a museum here in Dallas. But um, before we get into that, I want to go over some definitions to make you an, a more informed art connoisseur. So um, we, most people want to use the term fake and forgery interchangeably, uh, but they are actually two different things. So a fake is when you take an authentic object and you alter it in some way to deceive the buyer. So maybe you find you're cleaning out your attic and you find a painting in your attic that looks very impressionistic. Maybe even it looks like a, a Monet, but you know it's not a Monet. You know your, grand, your grandmother did it and she was just you know, a, a pretty good painter, but she was no Monet, but it looks pretty Monet-like. So you research what Monet's signature looks like and you put it on the painting and then you go to an auction house and you say, hey, I bought this, I found this Monet in my attic. What do you think? How much can I get for it? So that would be a fake, right? Because you're altering something that already exists to deceive someone else. And a forgery is a new work of art that's created in imitation of another artist's style or a, a work of higher value. So that would be if, um, let's use that Monet example again. You know, grandma is a really good painter and she's pretty good at doing some impressionistic work. So you say to grandma, hey, let's look at some early Monet works together. And then can you make a new one that's of a new setting, but um, can you make it to look like a Monet? So she's creating a new work of art to look like an artist work that already, you know, an artist ooh, and um, then you're, you're trying to get value from the new piece. So that's the difference between fake and forgery. And then there are copies, which is pretty self-explanatory, right? A copy is just, um, there's an authentic work of art, and then there's a work of art that someone has made in uh, like in reproduction of that authentic work. So it's like two works that look exactly the same, right? So you can't see it very well. That's why I put a circle around it. But um, there is a uh, painting behind Mike Pence's head. It's also on the right there. It's called Two Sisters. Um, and it is a Renoir painting. And um, so it is Donald Trump insists that he has the original Renoir Two Sisters. But as you can see here from this photo from the Art Institute of Chicago, they also insist that they have the Renoir called Two Sisters. Um, the museum has owned the painting since 1933. It was given to the museum by a donor upon her death. That donor purchased it from an art dealer in 1925 who bought it straight off of Renoir in 1881. Donald Trump maintains that he has the original. So which one is the copy? Um, I'm not gonna get into polit politics today, but I'll, I'll let you decide on your own which one is the copy. So we've got fakes, forgeries, and copies. Those are kind of the three big ones. So I'm going to take you back to the beginning of this 
tale. And this is the man who is responsible for the Meadows Museum of Art at Southern Methodist University. And I really came to appreciate Alger Meadows as I did the research for this presentation. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, he was born in Vidalia, Georgia in 1899 to parents who really instilled in him the values of Christianity, seeing the best in others and hard work. He really learned a lot of lessons living in you know small town Vidalia, but one of the big ones that he believed above all else was he really believed in kindness. And as a man, he never fired a single employee in his lifetime. And this was really a driving practice in his work, um, as well as in his relationships, in his family life, and with just complete strangers. In all of the research that I did for this lecture, I couldn't find a single bad word written about Algar Meadows as a person. He just seemed like a truly lovely human being. Um, but I say all of this about his trusting, kind nature to say that um, it will also be his downfall, uh, as, as I, will, I will try to show you here. I love this picture of him, like the face that he's making cracks me up. I wonder what was going on in this image. He was, Mr. Meadows was by all accounts, a man that was immune to the degeneracy that befell other men, except when it came to the negotiating table. Uh, when he was bargaining, he was brutal and cutthroat and he would always get the best deal. And again, these principles are gonna haunt him later in his run-ins with art swindlers and forgers, but they really paid off in business. By the age of 30, Mr. Meadows had financially engineered this new legal structure that allowed him to buy oil wells for um, less than half the upfront capital of other purchasers. And it took the oil industry like 15 years to catch up with what he was doing. So he was, this made Mr. Meadows a millionaire by his 30s. He was a billionaire by his 40s. And he was the owner of the largest percentage of stocks in his company, uh, General American Oil, by his 50s. So it's an understatement to say that Mr. Meadows did exceedingly well for himself. In the 1950s, a uh, very jet lagged and bored Mr. Meadows decided to go to the Prado Museum on um, a business trip to Madrid. And he was really inspired by what he saw and he decided then and there to start collecting Spanish art, like immediately. So he fell in love with collecting and it became an obsession and a sport. And the thrill for Mr. Meadows was about acquiring works of art under the most favorable conditions. Um, I might call it bargain hunting. He loved bargain hunting. And Mr. Meadows said about his collecting, quote, I had this compulsion. It's like self hypnosis. Nothing satisfies except to collect. And I'll give a little sidebar to say that at this time in Dallas and Fort Worth history, all, we had all of these like wildcatters who had made their fortunes out in the oil fields and, you know, came back wanting to prove that they were like cultured. And so they kind of started this competition, which is why we have so many amazing museums in Dallas and Fort Worth is because they all sort of peeled off and found their own niche. So like Eamon Carter started collecting American art. Alger Meadows started collecting Spanish art. We've got um, the Kimball, which is kind of like an encyclopedic collection. So they were collecting everything. Uh, so they were all like just playing off of each other to try to be more cultured than the next or to keep up with their counterparts. So this is this made for a very fertile art museum environment here in Dallas and Fort Worth. So we're really lucky that they were competitive guys. Um, Back to Mr. Meadows. So he loved negotiating and he used these skills to help build this budding collection of Spanish art. And after being moved by the Spanish old masters at the Prado, he arranged to speak with someone at the museum uh, who he thought was the chief restorer or the chief conservator. 
Um, and Geronimo Cesteros, uh, otherwise known as his nickname by his nickname of Six Fingers, which doesn't sound entirely trustworthy, um, was he was never the chief restorer at the Prado. Um, he had been a restorer at the museum, but it, he'd retired many years ago. And uh, Six Fingers neglected to tell Meadows about his employment or about his very interesting nickname. Instead, he agreed to be Mr. Meadows' personal art consultant and buyer. So Seis Dedos organized for Mr. Meadows to buy Sight Unseen, 10 works of art from the collection of Isabel de Bourbon. Um, Isabel was known for her great beauty, her intellect, and her noble bearing as the wife of King Philip IV of Spain. And Isabel was painted by the likes of Goya and Velazquez, and she very generously accepted gifts from her subjects without, uh, and those gifts were often works of art because she really loved art. So she would be gifted these works of art, never really did any kind of vetting process to bring them into her collection, never checked that they were what somebody claimed that they were. Um, and, and this detail about Isabel's collection was never revealed to Meadows who hungrily bought this lot of 10 paintings from the Bourbon estate. And if you're thinking to yourself, it's probably a bad idea to buy a group of 10 works of art that you've never seen before. You are very wise. Um, for all of his savvy in the business world, Mr. Meadows was totally over his head with the art world. He knew nothing about art. He knew that he liked it, but that's not enough to be uh, a really savvy art collector, right? Um, he really needed an advisor that would not, would have hit would have advised him and not taken advantage of him. But fortunately, that's not what he got. So this is how it begins. Uh, after the Bourbon cash, um, Meadows bought three El Grecos, a few Goyas, and four of Goyas murals for a grand total of approximately 230,000 US dollars. All of these works of art were bought under the supervision of Cesteros um, and were, quote, obtained at a small fraction of the market value for works by these painters. And as Meadows later said, quote, I didn't know that the value of work by Goya and El Greco was much higher either. I just didn't know anything about values. I had never seen a Goya change hands. Yet this didn't stop Meadows from continuing to purchase Spanish art. And it didn't stop any of his advisors who also continued to profit by getting, a, you know, um, like a, a cut of all of his art purchases and his art sprees. And it was Mr. Meadows' goal to build a little, little Prado um, like he had found in Madrid in Texas. And that's what we have. We have the Meadows Museum of Art. So after the death of his first wife, Virginia, and remarrying his second wife, Elizabeth, or Betty Meadows, and his new bride want, would bring um, a personal collection, they would begin a personal collection of art of their own. Um, and it was influenced by Betty's love of French art. And Mr. Meadows was still all this time buying Spanish art for his museum, but he turned to new help to build his French collection. And this help did not come from an established gallery or a dealer, but instead it came from the trunk of a car parked outside of Mr. Meadows' estate in Dallas. The names of the two art dealers, I put that in heavy quotations, um, to whom the car belonged were Fernard Legros and Real Lassard. And the works of the art that were in the trunk of their car were purportedly by the likes of Gauguin, Dufay, Chagall, Degas, and Derain, but they were really forgeries by the infamous Elgar de Hori. I said Elgar, but I meant Elmer. <laughs> Dohori has achieved status as a legendary art forger. Welcome to greatness. You're in the presence of greatness with this, this guy here. His life has been detailed in books, films, and even a musical, which I would love to see someday. And his prodigious career earned him the title of being the greatest art forger of our time. And so let me do a little sidebar here to talk about forgers in general. They are one of my favorite, they are probably my favorite art criminal, kind of art criminal. 
and they're a unique breed because they're really usually very lovable characters. And I think a lot of us can relate to them and their, their, why they turn to what they turn to. They're underdogs and I just really always find myself rooting for them. <laughs> um, they're usually trained as artists. They go to art school most of the time and they're, they really hope to make it on their own, but they, they don't. It's a cutthroat world to try to be an artist and they don't make it. Um, and they don't become an artist that is like a household name like Picasso or Van Gogh or Rembrandt. Um, they really struggle to make it in the art world by the, for their own work and on their own terms. And they're often deemed not good enough by critics or professors or the public and they're not able to make it on their own. And they fail as artists, you know, under their own names. And this is typically when the forgeries start. Usually it's on purpose, but sometimes it's accidental. Like when their work is taken seriously as a work of someone else, they can really, you know, like screw the art world that has, that has turned their backs on them. And I'm sure it must be like a very wonderful feeling of vindication. And it's easy to see why it would be hard to stop with just selling one forged painting. They get the opportunity to hoodwink the people that judged them so harshly. And you can also make a lot of money being someone else, um, more money than you could be by being yourself. And I'm sure that is a tough pill to swallow, you know, but you also get that thrill of like kind of giving it to the man. And like, I, I often wonder what it must feel like to have some critic or curator like turn up their nose at your own work, but then you end up selling them a forged Matisse that hangs on the wall of their stuffy museum and you make off with like cash in your pocket. I mean, that has to feel so good, right? So I, um, yeah, I kind of secretly love forgers. Maybe not so secretly. I'll just say it. I love forgers. But back to Dehori specifically. Uh, we don't know the definitive life story of Elmer Dehori, even though there have been books written about him and films made about him. Um, he was kind of like a chronic liar. <laughs> um, no surprises there, right? Uh, Dehori kept his past shrouded in mystery. And when he, when he was alive and he told the world that he was raised as an aristocrat, rubbing elbows with the rich and the richer, um, upon his death, one of his former assistants made it his life's work to try to piece together the facts and fictions of Dehori's life. But even then, we aren't really entirely sure where he was during certain periods of his life. There's a great book written about him called The Forger's Apprentice that I would highly recommend if you're intrigued by this guy and if any of his antics entertain you. So what we do know about Dehori is that he was born in Budapest in 1906 to a lower middle-class Jewish family. In the 1920s, he studied art in Munich and in Transylvania, which is now Romania, R Romania, but I think it's like so much more fun to say, so much more fun and spooky to say Transylvania. Um, he tells people that he also studied painting in Paris. And after school, he is convicted in at least five uh, different European cities for fraud but not art fraud. Uh, he was started his life in crime with check forgery, counterfeiting documents and falsely claiming an aristocratic title. Um, I don't know what fake title he was using. I haven't been able to find what he, what fake title he was using as an aristocrat, but I really hope that after his time in Transylvania, he went with the title of Count, like Count Dracula. Um, during World War II, Dehori claims he was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp, but again, we can't verify that. Uh, his whereabouts during the war are entirely unknown. What we do know is that he emerged from the war in 1946 in Paris, and he sells a drawing to a wealthy woman. Dehori claimed that the woman mistook the drawing as one of Picasso's. And Dehori, well, he just kind of allowed her to make that mistake and he rolled with it. So he's claiming it was an accident at that first time. But after this, Elmer started selling more forged drawings to galleries in Paris, claiming that they were from his private collection. 
And Dahori's area of specialization within forgery is the modern era. So we'll see that with some of his forgeries in a minute here. So by the end of the 1940s, Dahori's fakes earned him enough money to travel to America, where he has his first gallery show of his own work in New York City. And as you may have guessed from talking about foragers before, at his show, he sells only one painting. But outside of his gallery, he sells several forged Modigliani drawings and um, Matisse drawings to art dealers on both coasts. So in 1949, Dahori attempts his first Modigliani painting and he successfully sells it to a gallery in New York. And with this, Dahori moves out of the small time world of faked drawings and into the big time world of faked paintings, where, which earn a lot more money. Dahori begins selling these forged paintings to museums and even start seeing his work on the walls of museums like the Detroit Institute of Art and the Fogg Museum at Harvard University. Um, I like to try to imagine like what a rush that must have felt like to see a work that you made but no one knows you made on the walls of like a very prestigious museum. Uh, you must be on top of the world but also like quietly resentful. Uh, this is precisely why a lot of forgers end up wanting to get caught. So um, they, they know, they want the art world to know that they duped them and they want that satisfaction. So a lot of times forgers downfalls come because they will include a detail in a work of art that is like a dead giveaway. We call them Easter eggs. So they might like be painting or uh, Renaissance painting and include uh, a piece of technology that definitely wouldn't have been from the Renaissance, right? So some uh, uh, an eagle-eyed curator might look at that and realize, oh, this, you know, this is the clue that is telling me this is not what it really, we, what we think it is. So that's often how forgers end up getting caught and we have to assume this because they want to, right? So I thought we would play a little game here. Um, I'm gonna make it so I can see all some of you people. Okay, I'm gonna call on people, so be ready. Um, I wanted to pretend like we're art connoisseurs and play a little game of which one is the forgery and which one is the painting by the actual artist. Okay, so we've got two Modigliani's here. One is by Modigliani and one is by Elmer Dahori. So um, I'm gonna put Jordan on the spot first. So Jordan, if you could unmute and tell us which, which one do you think is the real one? I think the real one is on the right-hand side. Any specific reason why you think that? Just a, just a guess, a hunch? Something about it. Mm -hmm. looks it um, I almost feel like it looks like it could be fake and so that's, I'm going against my instincts I like it well guess what you're right that is that is the real one the real one the real Modigliani is on the right the Elmer de Hori is on the left okay so very good Jordan um okay who's willing to play this next one Sandy you look pretty eagle-eyed would I be able to call on you Uh, I will say um, the one on the right is the real one. The one on the left is the fake. Wow, you guys are good. Yes, you're exactly right. The Matisse, uh, the real Matisse is on the right. The, the Elmer de Hori is on the left. So bravo, you would not be making the same mistakes that some of these curators did. Okay, Lenora, you want to play with me? For the next one. Okay, so we have two Picassos here. One is the real one and one is the fake. What do you think? It's a guess. I'm gonna guess the one on the left is real, but I don't know why. You, you know, 
we call this um, connoisseurship in, in art history is when um, it's like this kind of mystical, magical, like veiled in secrecy quality that like curators and art historians have like to say that they, why they know certain things or this like instinct that they have that something's good or something's real. Um, and you guys have it because you're exactly right, Lenora. The one really? on the right is the fake, yes. <laughs> you know what made me think about it was the belt buckle. <laughs> oh, very good. All very right. Okay, who's gonna be my next player? John or Anne? I can see both of your faces. <laughs> I have one left. Let's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call on you, John. Is that okay? <gasps> okay, here we go. Here's the next one. This is Gauguin. Oh my. We've got a real and a fake. Is it, is it possible? Well, whoop. I, I, you're both talking. John, let's hear. From Sorry. You. It's okay. I'm going to guess that the one on the right is, is the real one. My goodness, you guys are four for four. Congratulations. I have given this lecture a few times and no one has gotten all of those right. So you, there's something special going on in this class that you guys, have you ever thought of becoming a curator or an artist? <laughs> <laughs> Lenora, did you want to say something? I was going to say we're retired, but is it also <laughs> possible, is it possible to have seen the one on the right? I, where is that? That's a good question. Um, I can look that up. I, I pulled it from from a museum collection for sure. I don't remember sure. which one off the top of my head. I think head. I've seen that painting. Probably you, you probably have. It's yeah. I I would I'll find out for you and I'll I'll send okay, it to Jordan. You. Okay. Okay, so back to Dahori here. Mm -hmm. um, so some of Dahori's uh, buyers start to become suspicious, uh, like the director of the Fogg Museum at Harvard and an art dealer in Chicago. They start to like put some puzzle pieces together. And you can imagine like if the same guy starts, keeps selling you these like all-star paintings by all-star artists, you might start to get suspicious. Like where is he getting all of these works of art? So people start to wonder and the director of Harvard's museum alerts the FBI who launch an investigation and Dahori flees to Mexico City with a fake passport. But he sneaks back into the US and he tries to make a living with his own art in living in Los Angeles. And he ekes out a very meager, unsatisfying career of painting uh, pink poodles, which is a lot of peas, um, for really rich LA people. And but ultimately, he craves this return, you know, this um, the adrenaline of making forgeries. So he heads back to the East Coast, where he meets a man named Fernand Legros. And if you thought Elmer Decorey was a character get a load of this guy, right? I mean, he is um, just larger than life. Those glasses, <laughs> amazing. So this is one of the dealers, I think the mastermind behind uh, hoodwinking Mr. Meadows. He was born in Egypt, um, though held French and US citizenships. And he had one time wanted to be a, and was training to be a professional uh, ballerina or ballet dancer. He was very suave and debonair with this air of, you know, exoticism that was hypnotic to the people that he swindled. And, you know, I think we can all agree from looking at these pictures that he, you know, he was a big personality. So Dahori meets um, Legros. And Dahori and Legros, they met in New York. They drive to Florida together. They hit, they hit it off, you know, drive to Florida together where they decide they're gonna have a business relationship. And Legros would peddle Dahori's fakes as originals and they'd make a handy profit. But while in Florida, Legros met Réal Lesard, who was from a small town in French Canada and was barely out of his teenage years when he um, met Legros. And they went on to have a, a very long personal and professional relationship. And Lesard was a, a painter in his own right as well. Um, but like Dahori, he was never really taken seriously and um, ended up turning to like small scale forgery, but not in this story. So 
So we have Legros, Dehori, and Lesar, and they've met and they've decided to go into business together selling Dehori's forgeries. The scheme was very simple. Dehori would churn out the forgeries and Legros and Lesar would peddle them. And one of their prime targets was Meadows. So on its surface, it's you know a lot safer of a situation for three men, um, especially Dehori, to go into business together. You know, Dehori can do what he does best, which is forging works of art by modern masters. And instead of having to worry about selling the paintings, Legros and Lassard can do this for him as they pose as important influential art dealers. And you know, remember this is before the internet uh, when anyone can check, you know, it's really hard, much harder to check your like credentials. Um, so it's more, it's easier to get away with lying, I think. Uh, so Legros and Lassard had heard tell of these wildcatters in, in DFW that we talked about earlier, who are all trying to race to build their own art museums. So they head out to Dallas and Fort Worth. And um, Algar Meadows was a pretty easy target, right? He, he loved a hard bargain and that was the most important thing to him. So Legros and Lesar, they roll up to Mr. Meadows' estate and they end up selling Meadows their first batch of paintings from out of the trunk of their car. And if this seems like a sketchy situation, uh, your intuition is correct. All of your alarm bells should be going off at the prospect of buying legitimate works of art from strangers out of the trunk of their car. Um, and if you're thinking to yourself, I would never do that. Well, congratulations, you would be a better art collector than Mr. Meadows at this point. Um, but Mr. Meadows, he had a hubris like we've talked about and it was his belief in this, his superior negotiation skills. And coupled with his lack of knowledge about the art world, his hunger for collecting, we've got a dangerous combination on our hands. So Meadows, uh, for his part, thought he was always getting the better of Legros and Lazar during their negotiations. He thought they were just peddlers and he felt like he was the one taking advantage of them. That's important, right? And Meadows felt like the duo of Lessard and Legros uh, could hardly match wits with a master negotiator like himself. And Meadows always thought he had the upper hand when Legros and Lessard would come to visit, which was frequently. And I love this quote. He says, Mr. Meadows said, when it was time, uh, when it came time for them to leave, I would always think of some excuse to be busy. Um, they court me like a virgin. No, I was busy that night. The next night? Mm, no, we were having some friends over during the day then. Well, I never knew exactly. Two or three weeks would go by when I knew they were spending some $200 a day in Dallas. They kept telling me they had to leave town. Well, I said, I haven't asked you to stay. If you want to sell it to me, I'll give you $45,000. They took it. But the joke was on Meadows because Legros and Lassard made out like bandits in this scheme. Um, because they were on the front lines and the ones accepting Mr. Money, Mr. Meadows' money, they knew how much money they were making. And it was a significant amount, enough that they were able to buy a lavish apartment together in Paris. But the situation was never equitable because Dehori back in Florida never had any clue how much money Legros and Lassard were making um, because they only gave him like a very small monthly stipend. So eventually in the late 1950s, uh, Legros and Lassard built Dehori a home in Ibiza where he continued to churn out the forgeries. And it was when Legros and Lassard built this home for Dehori that Dehori started to put two and two together and they, he realized that Legros and Lassard had cheated him. Uh, so regardless, Elmer Dehori relishes his time in Ibiza he swans about his house and he throws these like lavish, raucous dinner parties. And Meadows continues to happily buy from Legros and Lassard until he asks um, Donald Vogel, a gallery owner in Dallas, to sell a few of his French paintings. And just as a random aside, um, I met Donald Vogel's daughter the other day. I was taking in a work of, um, a work of art to get framed and uh, was talking to the framer and this other woman walked in and she introduced herself. I forget what her first name is, but she said Vogel. And I was like, as in Donald Vogel? Like, 
the hero of the story of Mr. Meadows forgeries? And she was like, yeah, was that, he's my dad. Um, so that's, that's, you know, Dallas is really a small town after all, I guess. But anyway, so uh, Meadows invites Donald Vogel to his house. And at this time, Meadows has amassed this like huge collection, just buying paintings willy-nilly out of the back of Legros and Lassard's cars. Um, but he'd never had an expert look at it. Sounds familiar, right? So in the late 1960s, um, Meadows is hoping that Donald Bogle will look at his paintings because he has such a huge collection at this point, he wants him to sell, sell some of them for him. And um, Donald Vogel was the first person to look at the collection and to tell Mr. Meadows that they were not original paintings. And after seeing them and being completely horrified, uh, Donald Vogel suggested that Meadows should have his paintings looked at by um, professionals. At this point, uh, Legros Saint Lessard had moved back to Paris. They'd done well enough in their forgery scheme to live this like very lavish life. And Dehori is just living it up in his home in Ibiza. So the band has broken up, like they're not making forgeries together and, um, but they're all living, living good lives. And so Donald Vogel, arranges for a group from the Art Dealers Association of America to look at Meadows' collection. And two members of the delegation were ardent pursuers of forgeries, and they were known as uh, the witch hunter of the one lived on in LA and one lived in New York. And they were known in the art world as the witch hunter of the West and the witch hunter of the East, which is a detail I just love about this story. <laughs> So this entire delegation of art professionals comes to look at Mr. Meadows' collection. And the delegation's verdict was, quote, of the 58 items which are viewed by our members, it is our opinion that 11 of them are or may be by the artist to whom you think they are attributed, and 44 are not by the artist to whom they are attributed. And after this indictment, as Vogel wrote, quote, all hell broke loose. So one of the members of the committee of the art dealer committee leaked the details of their visit to um, the news and major newspapers like the New York Times and huge stations like NBC ran this story. And it became such a popular tale of woe that even Princess Margaret is reported to have spent an evening quizzing an American visitor about the plight of Mr. Meadows. And Meadows was thrust onto the scene. He had little time to prepare or to hide or deny. Instead, um, very refreshingly, Alger Meadows um, owned up to his fias the fiasco and his role in it, which you know we don't see a lot today, right? <laughs> we don't see people like owning up to their mistakes. So he went along. Um, he went along with the suggestion to send his French paintings to a tribunal of experts in Paris, who would review his collection and reassess. And in his magnanimous way, Mr. Meadows ponied up an additional three million dollars for an actual, like, legitimate art dealer to go out and buy him quote the real things. Um, and when his Spanish collection was similarly assessed. Meadows asked William Jordan, who was the newly appointed director of Meadows' brand new museum, to use another million dollars to replace the forgeries in that collection with the originals. So uh, you know you're pretty loaded um, when you're told that pretty much everything you bought is worthless, and then you can just go out and replace them all with originals. <laughs> so pretty mind blowing. So when Legros hears what's going on, he hightails it to Elmer's home in Ibiza and attempts to hide there. Dehori wants nothing to do with Legros any longer after realizing how much he'd been cheated and also knowing that his own neck is on the line. So Elmer skips out um, of Ibiza and lives the life of an exile. Legros uh, manages to elude the police for years but was eventually picked up in Rio de Janeiro and extradited to France. He was convicted of artistic and financial fraud and sentenced to two years in jail and a $3,000 fine, which you know is really just a slap on the wrist. 
um, he got out of it, uh, most of it due to quote, psychiatric evidence. And what we all might know Legros a little bit better um, if the creator of Tintin, the French comic had finished his last book uh, he had created a character based on Legros. The character was named uh, Endadine Akas, and he aptly ran a network of forgers. Uh, like the real Legros, the character was charismatic and charming and larger than life. Um, the real Legros died in 1983 of throat cancer while in France. Lestar also did some time in jail and continues to live in France and paint. He makes money off of, he made some money off of writing a book about his experience with Legros called L'Amour de Faux. And um, according to the internet, which, you know, is never wrong, he is still alive and living in Paris. So Elmer de Horry manages to elude the police for quite some time, almost two years, but eventually decides to throw in the towel and return to Ibiza where he is promptly ar ar arrested, but on charges of homosexuality, not forgery. So um, the Spanish police could not prove that Dahori had ever done any of the forgeries on Spanish soil. So they weren't allowed to arrest him for this crime, but they did, uh, arrest him for, for being gay uh, for two months, which was you know, sadly considered a crime back then. So when he emerged from jail, Dahori is a celebrity. Clifford Irving wrote a book about him and Orson Welles made a film about him, launching him into the stratosphere. So looking at this book that was written about Dahori, does anyone notice a mistake on the book cover? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give it to you. It shouldn't be titled um, fake, it should be titled forgery, right? Because he wasn't making fakes, he was making forgeries. So his fame and happiness were short-lived um, as Dahori finds out that the Spanish and French police are still trying to figure out how Dahori could be tried in France for his forgery crimes. And at the time, Spain and France didn't have an extradition agreement. Um, so Dahori was safe as long as he stayed in Spain and the extradition agreement remained null and void. But on December 11th, 1976, Dahori was informed that Spain and France had reached an agreement and Dahori would be extradited to France. And fearing jail and that Legros who was there in jail would have him killed in prison, Dahori overdosed on sleeping pills that evening. So sadly, that was the end of one of history's most charismatic forgers. Meadows referred to himself as quote, Mr. Sap, and uh, as the whole fiasco roiled around him, but he managed to take the notoriety in stride and he talked openly about being swindled and laughed along with his friends at his gullibility. Meadows said about the situation, quote, I must say, I'm glad it happened. It's been such a shock that has caused me to think very deeply about what I will do in the future. It will be done in a much more satisfactory way. It will be done in a much more enlightened way. It will be even greater for this heritage of ours. Um, you know, none of us like to be taken advantage of, but publicly, Mr. Meadows seemed to take it in stride and he was even able to look on the bright side of things, which you know, it's a really admirable quality and probably also helped by the fact that he had billions of dollars. <laughs> so Meadows joked that he quote, I might build me a room on the side of the house in Dallas. It will be my quote, experience with fake paintings room. And in a way he did that. Uh, today at the Meadows Museum of Art, there is one little room tucked away, um, like kind of near the bathrooms and they're all of the forged paintings are hanging there and they have it doesn't say on the placard you know this is a forged work by Elmer de Horry. instead it says stuff like um you know attributed to uh Francisco Goya or attributed or um in the style of um this you know such as Velasquez 
So um, I think, you know, a lot of museums are embarrassed if they buy a fake or a forgery and hide it. And, you know, we never hear the stories about museums uh, buying those things. I would, you know, we hear, we hear some of them, but I would venture a guess like we don't hear 95% of those stories. And I love that Mr. Meadows just like owned up to it and, you know, far from disgracing the museum, I think it shows the hanging those forgeries up show Mr. Meadows like humility and his resilience. And I think it's something, you know, we could all actually learn from. But what else did we learn today? Um, here is some guidelines. So what not to do when collecting art. These are some things we learned from Mr. Meadows. Don't buy works of art that you haven't seen, um, especially if they're worth a lot of money. Do not buy groups of art in lots or groups. So don't buy like 10 paintings together. Know how much works of art by the same or similar artists cost in the current art market. And absolutely do not buy art out of the back of someone's car that you do not know. That is, that should be rule number one. Um, but all's well that ends well. Not only do we have a great story involving one of the most infamous art criminals of our time, we also have that small Prado in Texas that Mr. Meadows wanted, um, which is really, it's the largest collection of Spanish art outside of Spain. And it is in Dallas and it is um, a very minimal entrance fee. I think it's like $5 or something like that. So we are all winners in the end. Um, so thank you for your time on that. I do wanna tell you about um, something that's coming up. So I um, so enjoy talking about art crime with the Ollie members and Stephanie, who's in charge of Ollie uh, said, hey, we should do a trip, and, uh, an art crime adventure. And I was like, sign me up because that sounds like so much fun to me. So we were planning on doing a trip this spring, but of course um, the world had other plans. So we are pushing it off until next spring. It is going to be a 12 day, 13 night romp through some of the greatest art crime cities of Europe. And we're gonna start the trip in Amsterdam where we'll be for a few days. Um, we'll be there like when the tulips are going into full bloom at Kuchenhof Gardens. And Amsterdam is just, oh, it's one of my favorite cities in the world. It's um, such a beautiful city. And I think it gets a bad rap because of, um, yeah, I think it gets a bad rap worldwide, but it's just, oh, it's, the, it's like just in the springtime, I don't think there's a better city than Amsterdam. It's just amazing to be in. So uh, we'll be going to the Van Gogh Museum um, where they have had some a pretty epic theft and we'll be talking about that. We'll be going to the Rijksmuseum where we'll talk about the Night Watch, which has been uh, vandalized many times for idealistic reasons. And we'll also be talking about the probably my favorite forger, even though well, he might be tied with Elmer de Horry, but Han van Meeren, uh, who was one of the greatest forgers of his time for sure. And it's a wild story that I couldn't make up. I couldn't make those details up if I tried. Um, from Amsterdam, we go to Paris, which, you know, museums, art, like it doesn't get better than Paris. And when we're in Paris, we'll be going to the Louvre and talking about the theft of the Mona Lisa. We'll be going to the Chateau Fontainebleau, where there's been a, it's been the site of um, a series of really epic thefts. That, there's been like a, a ring of thefts of Chinese objects from museums around Europe, and nobody can figure out who's doing them. They're involved like repelling through glass ceilings and like it's the lengths that these thieves have gone to is insane to, to steal these objects. And there's kind of an interesting twist with who we think is doing them. But um, 
after Paris, we'll head to London, which if any city can rival Paris for art and museums, it's London. And in London, we'll be going to the Tate Modern and talking about some other uh, for a forgery duo there. And um, at the uh, National Gallery, we'll talk about the theft of Goya's uh, Duke of Wellington, which is on the right. And uh, one of my obsessions is I love this list that the London Times put out of the top 50 art museums in the world. And I have slowly been checking museums off the list. So uh, all the ye yellow museums are the museums that I've been to so far. So I think I have like six left to go, which is exciting. Um, but on this trip, you too will can start checking museums off your list. So all the red arrows are ones that we would absolutely be going to as part of the lectures. So that's um, five museums. And then the gray ones are also museums in the cities that we'll be going to. And you'll have your own time to, you know, explore. And if you're not museumed out, I would highly recommend going to those ones because they're incredible too. Um, so that's just a little, you know, if you enjoy stuff like that too, uh, checking things off your list, you'll be able to do that on this trip. And I think that's it for me talking at you guys. I'd love to open it up to questions if you have any questions um, or comments or anything. Okay, and feel free to unmute yourself or put something in the chat. We did get a question uh, from Mr. Davis in the chat wondering, since you love art forgery, if the remake of The Thomas Crown Affair was your favorite movie, and if you've seen the recent film, The Last Vermeer. Great questions. Um, I think I'm partial to the original Thomas Crown Affair, um, though the, the remake is pretty cool too. Uh, my favorite, um, uh, art crime movie is I would say uh, the great Muppet caper uh, where you know that's where like Miss Piggy is like part of this diamond uh, this ring that's like stealing this giant diamond and that epic scene where she like crashes through the glass ceiling on a motorcycle I love that one and I'm totally blanking on the movie right now but there's one with Cary Grant as a cat burglar and um, oh what am I thinking of guys Oh, I'll have to look it up, but that's to another catch one. A thief. Yes, to catch a thief. Yes, 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 yes. That's it. You guys knew. I love that one too. That's such a classic. And Grace um, Kelly, right? The two of them. That's. Yep. D did you see the last room? I haven't seen that one yet. I need. Yes, I'm going to write that down. What did you think of it? Oh, maybe unsharing screen share. What did you think, Mr. Davis, of the last Vermeer? Oh, and you're, you're still muted if you're trying to respond. There you go. Uh, Guy Pierce stars as your favorite art forger after World War II on trial in Holland. Oh, the, the Van Meheren. Yep. You, I, is that new? Yeah. It's yeah, I, I okay. saw it earlier this year. Yeah, I haven't seen that yet. I heard it got mixed reviews, um, but I, I I will absolutely see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the uh, the other thing to mention is if you've never seen it, it's not about art theft or forgery, but Tim's Vermeer. Yes, that is a great movie. That is a great movie. I really enjoyed that one. Good good suggestion, Anne. Yes, I was thinking that maybe some of the art forgeries would be exact copies of originals. Is there another name for making for forging an exact copy so it is identical to the original? Yeah, you're, you you actually already said the word. It's a, it's just called a copy or oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yes, um, that was probably a lot easier to do before the internet, and we definitely okay. have cases of that right like there is even a rumor that like the Mona Lisa is 
there are you know, lots of copies of the Mona Lisa out there and that the theft of the Mona Lisa um, was when she was stolen, that is when all those copies were made and that the Louvre doesn't actually have the real one. So there's like a huge conspiracy theory about that. Menorah. Did the Gardner Museum in Boston robbery ever get solved? Maybe is the question, maybe is, is an unsatisfying answer, but I think it probably has been solved, but the FBI has not uh, revealed that yet. They've been very vague about the information that they've received and so I think they might. I think they might know who's done it at this point, and I suspect that the works have been destroyed, very badly. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. But there's a new. I don't know if you guys have Netflix, but there's a Netflix sure. show that's coming out about that, a documentary series about the Gardner theft. So I think that comes out today, maybe, um, or ne or maybe it's the sixth of April. Um, so yeah, I I can't wait for that. Do you know what it's called? What? Yes, I have it right here. Just give me one second and I'm gonna find it for you. I got asked to write an article about it for a newspaper, but um, I just didn't have time. So it is called, this aptly named, This is a Robbery. <laughs> <laughs> and it says it debuts April 7th. So we all have that to look forward to. And then I think there was a question in the chat. Let's see. Oh, you answered it, Jordan. Um, as my students always know, my philosophy is always the more the merrier. I love um, my, I always say that to my students and they end up bringing like their moms to class or their, you know, siblings. I've had a lot of siblings in class. I love when people bring like their boyfriend or girlfriend, like it's like a, coming to class is like a date. It's really, I take that as a compliment. Um, so anyway, my philosophy is always the more the merrier. So I'd love if it was just a big, you know, big bunch of us. And uh, I, I don't want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Evans, but I wanted to know if you wanted to maybe touch on, you mentioned some work that you're doing that relates maybe to trauma or something. I think you oh, had to yeah. skip past it earlier. I don't know if you wanted to say a couple things about that. Oh. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, something that I've been working on with a group is um, is this idea of like what happens when the pandemic is over and we all go, we, we are allowed to go back to museums. Like what can we do as art museum educators to help help people heal from that, um, heal from the pandemic using art. So we're not trying to be therapists or art therapists, but we all believe that art has a therapeutic purpose, that you can have therapeutic experiences with art, works of art that allow you to connect with other people or connect with yourself in a way that other art forms do in different ways, you know? So, um, so we're, it's, we're kind of a working think tank group. Uh, there's a art therapist from the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, La Musée des Beaux-Arts, and the director of education at the Clark Arts Institute in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, two of my former students, one at the Cincinnati Art Museum and one at the Dallas Museum of Art, and then um, a woman at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And we have spent a lot of time together wondering what this would look like for how this will play out for museums and what we can do as educators to like help people deal with the trauma of the pandemic, you know, from losing loved ones to losing jobs, um, what role museums and art can play in helping people move past the, the pandemic. So that's what that's about. We're working on a, an article that will be coming out in December and a book chapter as well. So thanks for asking, Jordan. Certainly. You know, if there are any additional questions? Dr. Evans, yeah. um, I don't know if you are aware that the College of Education had a grant from the Meadows Foundation back in the uh, 80s to early 90s to prepare both elementary and secondary education students. 
I didn't know that. I would love to hear more about that. Was it using, was it to use art in the classroom or not no. art related at all? It really wasn't art related. It was just to pre, uh, prepare the best teachers possible. And uh, in, initially it was a five-year program. Students were accepted. And at the end of five years, they were awarded both a bachelor's and a master's degree oh. in education. How and interesting. We prepared several hundreds of students over those 12 years. Wow, you sound like you were an integral part of that. Well, Dr. Watt Black was the director and I was the assistant director and took over as director after he retired. Oh my goodness, wow, uh, that sounds amazing. Uh, congratulations on getting the grant, which is not easy to do. And, um, you know, putting hundreds of teachers into the world that sound like they were very well prepared by you. Right, and the College of Education does have a Meadows chair oh. in the college. Wow, that is, I, I had no idea. That's really interesting. Is there somewhere where I could go to read more about that? Uh, well, obviously you could check with the Dean's office in the College of Education, mm -hmm. but back in the early 80s, Dr. Jim Miller, Dr. Uh, Jim Miller, who is the Associate Dean and, uh, Oh, my memory fails me. Who is the dean? Dr. Jim. Uh, they were the ones who approached the Meadows Foundation to just get some money to maybe buy some equipment, computers or whatever. And the Meadows Foundation came back and said, well, why don't you dream bigger? Wow. And uh, I forget what the total amount was, maybe about $5 million <gasps> over the course of those 10, 12 years. Holy moly, that is amazing. Wow. You don't hear stories like that often where they come back to you and say, how about we give you some more money than you asked for? Yes. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience working with the foundation. Well, congratulations. And thanks for telling me. It's really cool and inspiring. And a bit of news about Dr. Jim Miller, who happened to be the founding dean of Emeritus College, which became Ollie at UNT. I, I got to know him briefly um, during that time. Wow. Well, Dr. Evans, we really appreciate you taking the time to present to us this afternoon. And um, I hope that everybody enjoyed yourself. I see some applause all oh, around. Thank you. The Zoom applause. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It is always such a treat. And I love talking to you guys. And I really hope that I get to see you in person this fall and you're always welcome to come visit and see that and wander the halls of those new buildings and um, see the art that's that's up. I'm um, yeah, love to have you. Great. Well, we look forward to it. And I uh, guess without any further ado, everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Be well. Bye, Thank everyone. you. Get your vaccine. <laughs>